Well, welcome to this special Let's Talk and my very special guest, Mr. Dave Corney. Dave. Very special, thank yeah. you very much. Nice well, to meet let's you. Talk, then. Yeah. Let's talk. Dave, uh, can I ask you, what are you doing in Spain today? Um, apart from having an awful lot of friends over here, I'm doing a show at the Lounge Bar, which yeah. has been uh, arranged for me by the one and only Caroline. Absolutely. Uh, the brains yeah. of the outfit. Uh, in my um, plans for world domination, she's sorting out the <laughs> Spain bit, you know what I mean? <laughs> And what, what will you be doing at the lounge bar? Is it a sort of audience week? It's, it's like a Q&A, yeah. It's just yeah. I jump up and anything that anyone wants to know about anything that was in that little world, as long as I don't drop somebody in it, you know, I'll give you a good, honest chat. I was a good friend of all the craze, Charlie, yeah. uh, Ronnie Ridge, Lenny McLean, Roy Shaw, Charlie Richardson. They're all very, very good friends of mine. And um, apart from Frankie Fraser, but I do know him very well. <laughs> um, so, you know, and, and it's people that are intrigued by the sort of criminal, naughty side of life or whatever, you know, whatever they think it might be. Yeah. But please believe me, the crime world is only glamorous on the big screen and in books. It's not, not in real life. Talking of books, um, I was reading one of your books, Stop the Ride, I Want to Get Off, um, just doing a, a bit of research on you. And I'll be on, honest with you, I didn't think I was going to enjoy it. It's not my sort of thing. But having started to read it, it is a it's funny, line. Isn't it? it is a very good read. Yeah. I, I actually don't like the, um, the, the, the the celebrity gangster label that I have attached to myself. You know, like, it, I'm actually just someone that's got a million telephone numbers with a million different people. Yeah. Because some of them are sparkly in the gangster world, I then got uh, tired as the top gangster. You know, there is no such thing as a celebrity gangster. Right? The two words don't go. It's like saying police intelligence. Right? Yeah. You can be one or the other. And the more famous you get for being naughty, the less naughty you can actually be. You understand what I mean? You I know? do, I do. But you know, I, I've so spoken to. By the time to... I've wrote the book, I'll then become a, in everyone's eyes a famous baddie. But that's actually saying I'm not. Stop the ride. I want to get off. You mm. know, it's actually. Um, I think it's funny. I think it's a funny book. So how do you refer to yourself, um, Dave? <laughs> how do I refer to myself? The, the gangster bit. Um, I really don't believe. I, I've got a lot of colourful friends. Mm. I was known as the Yellow Pages, meaning, you know, in, in no other world more than, than the criminal world, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And I knew everybody, mm. you know, and, and after doing the Cray Twin funeral, that brought me to the attention of the general public because the next day they had head, like, headlines like um, heir to the throne yeah. and yeah. celebrity. Well, I really didn't, didn't need that. So just as publicly, I wrote that, stop the ride, I want to get off. Yeah. And, and I bowed out of it. And I think I'm a much better show-off and celebrity than I ever was gangster. Do you enjoy being a celebrity? I enjoy being Dave, right? And I'm not, I'm not actually trying to glamorise crime. I'm glamorising Dave. I'd have been a glamorous postman. I'd have been a cocky milkman. I'd have been a... Yeah, yeah I'm just going, get a load of me. Right? Yeah. Sorry if you're going to keep talking about something, you know. But that is your past. That's what, you know, has made you famous, really. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm theatrical, right? I like, I like the fancy clothes and the da -da, and in whatever I do or I have done I try to incorporate that bit mm -hmm. so when I was on the criminal side of the uh, yeah I, I'd done that as flamboyant and as da -da, yeah. as possible as well so I suppose in the little time that I was active it, I got a lot of there's a lot of stories out there about Dave Courtney oh absolutely <laughs> and they're all in here as and well all in there. and some Fantastic characters. That's what really struck me. Yeah. All these people you write about, they're real characters. They are real, yeah, yeah. And, I, and I'm, um, uh, my contribution to the criminal world is this. I install morale. I make you think you can. Mm. And that's dangerous, where the authorities are concerned. I mean, that's, that's like Alamo stuff, yeah? yeah? And I bring an awful lot of people together under the Dave Courtney umbrella that on paper wouldn't actually get on with each other, but the common denominator is real friends of Dave, so I'll talk to you, you know. Mm. And um, they are a bunch of, if they're all in the same room, a very colourful, <laughs> strange bunch of characters. I can imagine yeah. you lot being all together <laughs> it's on funny. holiday in Spain somewhere. It's quite a riot. It's as well. I took yeah. 150 of them to Tenerife after the, uh, I've done the security of the Christian yeah. funeral. I yeah. took 150 of them on holiday. So that is, that is just 
the most testosterone buzz you've ever had in your life. You know, walking down the beach with 150 bald-headed flat nose. <laughs> Amazing. I was there two weeks, not one bloke ran up and said, do you want to buy a time share? <laughs> Nothing. I had none of that. I had none of that. You know? I, I just want to take you back to the, the start of this book because it, it interests me that you say that people are born naughty. That's they true. don't become naughty. You, you honestly believe people have that certain gene inside them. One, I do believe it. And two, I am so... 100% right about that. It is in your genes, you are born naughty. Mm. People that are not born naughty and try and be naughty, they're the ones that end up being informants and cowards and all things like that. And uh, you can't say to a judge, um, there is no green areas for me to play on and the classrooms are too packed, so I'll rob the post office. You can't say it to me either, it's in your genes. And if you're council estate material or silver spoon material, if you're naughty, you're naughty, you know? Mm. You'll be Nick Neeson if he was a stock exchange or... Yeah. yeah. It's just in you, you can't help it. The same as being dishonest to your missus or a coward. You know what I mean? You can't train yourself not to be a coward, it's just in you. Yeah. Because your parents, you know, your father worked, I believe, for the gas board yeah. all his life. Yeah, both coven scout leaders, yeah. proper church goers, you know. And your mum was a store detective at Woolies. I actually got caught in the shop with my mum. I actually got mom? caught thieving in the store. <laughs> but my mum was a store detective. She loved me for that. Yeah. So what did they think of you and you know, um, as you grew up? They were banging their head against the wall because I've got a um, uh, younger brother and sister that there was no, you know... I'm not actually saying there's anything wrong with me, but I know I was different than them. There's a gene in me that... You know, now they're actually acknowledging the fact that there is something called ADHD. Yeah. It's not, an, if, if it's real, it's not actually a new illness, it's just newly discovered. And what the authorities would call a, a persistent reoffending criminal might be someone that actually had ADHD that just couldn't, yeah. you know, when you go to them, why did you smash that window? And they go, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. You know, why did you nick a cup? You understand what I mean? And that genuinely might be, um, a reason or, 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 or uh, an illness that a lot of people in prison have had yeah. or have, but just don't know. And I might, I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to justify being Dave, but I, I was I was the odd black sheep in my family. I was earning an awful lot of money very early. Uh, I had an awful lot of bigger friends than mine because I'm the court jester. Mm -hmm. I'm not actually the best fighter on the firm at all. I'm the court jester and everyone looked after Dave because he was a funny old bloke. <laughs> right? And I'm afraid, uh, as cocky as this might sound, there is such a thing as natural leader material and natural soldiers. Mm. Yeah? Yeah, uh, yeah, Each are as important as the other one, right? And I'm afraid I was leader material and when you're in charge of anything, you have to take the blame and the credit for an awful lot of things that are all to do with you. But you're so fearless. You know, I you don't said know about that. You want to see me with a spider? Well, <laughs> but you said you can see in people's eyes. You know, if they're yeah, a yeah. fighter or, yeah. or just bigging it. What I mean by that is, just say for instance, if there's a room of people, if I was gay, I would be able to recognise another gay man in the room that no one else could. If I was a heroin user, I'd recognise another heroin user in the room that no one else could. And if I was Premier Division naughty man, yeah. I would see naughtiness in you. It wouldn't matter what the frame was like, it wouldn't matter what the wrapping was like, I'd see in that bit whether you could hurt me or not. Yeah. What do you see in my eyes? Oh, God, don't, don't, don't do that. It's not like a tarot card reading. No, oh, no, exactly no, that. No. You're a lovely old fella. Look, no fireworks, but like, you know. You're yeah. like, but that's the difference between you and me. You couldn't hurt me. No, no. There's no vicious, no. there's no spiteful, there is no, you're not even cunning. You're just quite open. Yeah. You're quite. But I've got this shaven head, you know, and, yeah. and all that. But I just wouldn't be able to get away with it. <laughs> not, not with you, anyway. <laughs> no, well, not with me. No, no. In television, you can. You know what makes me laugh? These, you get these, you get these um, quizzes. Who's the toughest man on TV? And they come out with something like um, Phil Mitchell. You know, yeah, only yeah. because they've given the haircut, given the lines, given the overalls, and there is what. Men should say who's the toughest. I don't actually know any, any man at all that's ever going to go home and go, I think I'll ring up and tell him who I think's the um, <laughs> toughest man in Great Britain. I don't know any men. Right, so you'll get a woman's perspective of who they think is tough yeah. and who not. You understand what I mean? But when you get that reputation, you know, you had guys travelling down from Scotland to take you I've on. Had, I've had guys coming from other countries to do it, yeah. And it's not always at your choice of moment no. that they decide they want to fight you. Yeah, and, and I'll get people that want to go and put an hole in me for nothing more than 
I'm Dave Courtney. They've yeah. never met me in their life. Never met me in their life. But because I live on that half of London, they're mortal enemies, or because I actually know this person here is associated with, you know, judged by association and all that. So, um, well, what's that like, con continuing having to look over your shoulder? I don't look over my shoulder. All my enemies are dead. <laughs> so, <laughs> joke. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have to look over my shoulder. The truth is, is I can justify all my, all my, my own personal behaviour. I, I can justify it with me, and once I've justified something in my head with me, then you're in trouble. I was a debt collector. Yeah. I'm not super gangster, bank robber, murdering, right? And it's very easy for me to put my Robin Hood hat on, because you, Mr. A, have took half a million quid off Mr. B, and it's my job to get it back. What methods I use might be um, redeemed by someone as illegal or whatever, but after the actual event, the person who got the money would call me God, and the person who I took the money off would actually call me the devil. So it depends on what side of the fence you're sitting on when you employ Dave Courtney, and it's very easy for me to justify my behaviour because I'm a debt collector. Mm. Yeah? And, and that, that really is it. And I've learned how to do that properly by, by women. Mm. Women can teach you so much, can't they? Can't they? <laughs> right, you know, I mean, if you're having a row with your missus and she's giving you all that to her, that's it, get out, I've had enough of you. That's not nice. But when you come home and they go, I've had enough, the band's here. So that's when you're going, oh look, I'm really sorry, <laughs> you know, and, and, and debt collecting has gone psychology that way, you understand? I mean, rather than kicking someone's door down and flying around his front room, you know, there's other ways now, there's a clever way, isn't there? Clever ways. And you, lo you learned a, a lot of your sort of clever ways in, in prison. I'm afraid that that's true, but the, the general consensus of opinion is you actually go to prison and learn a, no a load of new crimes and come out clever. That's not exactly what happens. What actually happens is, when you go to prison, there's gonna be no one in there clever to teach you anything. They all got caught. Mm. No one in there is a criminal mastermind and all you are gonna learn is how not to do it. Yeah. Because they all got caught. Right? And so if you learn the 50 different ways that they're all in prison for, and then when you come home, you still wanna be a criminal and you can remember what not to do, yeah. That would make you a cleverer criminal. Yeah. You haven't actually gone in there and learned anything. No one in there can teach you nothing. They're all in prison. They've all got caught. Yeah. All you'll learn is how not to do it. Yeah? And what was Worm's Scrubs like? Oh, beautiful. <laughs> Absolutely. It was very sort of like El Garvey. <laughs> um, but what, reading, you know, again, you've met so many different characters in, in there. Yeah. It sounded like don't, fun. Yeah, don't, don't forget. Oh, I haven't actually done a, a long prison sentence. No. I've only actually been sentenced once for three and a half years. That's right. And out of that, I've done 18 months. Um, but in reality, in life, you don't learn nothing at all unless it hurts you. Like you have to actually go, oh, that's hot. I won't touch that again. Yeah. And any time at all that I was in prison for that year, that you went to my cell and said, would you like to go home? I'd go, yes. Right? But actually, as soon as I'd done that 18 months in there, it was the most educational period of my life and the bit that I would never change because right there happening to me at 20 years old stopped me ever going to prison again. Mm. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it was invaluable to what I learned there. So, um, bad things happening to you actually wise you up. You've got to go through the pain. Mm. Yeah? Absolutely. Ronnie Cray's funeral. Yeah. That's what brought you to the screamingly yeah, yeah, into yeah, the public eye. Yeah. yeah. How did you get involved in that in the first place? Um, I actually had a security company at the time in London. It was the biggest security company in London at the time. The rave scene had just kicked in and everywhere needed um, hundreds of doormen and I had eyed them in abundance. And um, contrary to the belief that there was a Cray empire or a Cray fortune or uh, anything like that, and there wasn't actually one. And um, how do I say this nicely? They they would use whatever methods they could from behind the door to get whatever it is they wanted done, or by anyone that would be foolish enough to go, oh, you're crazy, mm. which I was as a young man. Mm. And um, I went up and met them and became very, very friendly with all three of them. Charlie then stayed at my house, went on holiday, and. Um, I've done bits and pieces of Reggie Quay when Ronnie died. That no one actually thought of security until there was a uh, a threat. I was going to say a death threat, but he's already dead. He rang up and said they was going to come and desecrate the body yeah, in the yeah. uh, funeral parlour. 
he then rang me and said, look, do you mind doing the security down there at the funeral parlor so it don't happen? And a little bit of security on the day, you know, they'd never been a big, but as the actual day grew closer, I could see the, the hugeness of the, of the, of the projects that uh, was quite daunting. You know, I actually picked my own personal choice of 150 of what I thought were the tastiest people I knew in the world. Yeah. And they were going to try and control a crowd of three quarters of a million people. You know? They're not take that fans, you know what I mean? They're either gangsters, would be gangsters, have been gangsters, want to be gangsters. And um, to actually control that little lot, I, I needed deterrence. I needed something quite frightening. So I, I, I accumulated 150 of what Dave Courtney's army and it worked a treat. But I'd done that good of a job that the press fell in love with Dave, the authorities just, <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. You know, they looked at that as an army and no one in England's allowed to have a private army apart from like the army. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. I love the bit where you go into the funeral parlour um, to organise a, a few bits and pieces and the lady behind the counter asked for some identification. And I gave him one knuckle dust. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Courtney, you said, that, that, the, you know, you know people say you could, I could cut my tongue out, yeah, when you said the wrong thing. That happened to me in that funeral parlour. The worst, the silliest move I ever made is I, is I met uh, Sir Paul Condon. Yeah. And we was arranging the um, security of Ronnie Craig's funeral. And uh, I can't help but be a little bit cocky. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't mean to be offensive, but I'm a little bit cocky. And I was showing off about what I had and what I didn't have. And he was, was discussing, we did want to be treading on each other's toes in the security thing. And uh, I was actually just being a little bit cocky by saying like, we're not wearing these bibs like the bright orange bib things. I said, some of these blokes got £3,000 overcoats on. You're trying to convince him to put a bright green bib over the top of it. Oh, it's pretty slim, mate. And I said, you know, they're, um, unless you know who is who here, the church only holds 250 people. Yeah. Do you know what 250 to let in and what three quarters of a million not to? Do you know who to let into the funeral parlour and kiss Ronnie? Who to say no to? Do you know who to allowed to come around the actual hole in, in the cemetery and who to wait outside. And if you don't know, I said, these people here are not great policemen fans. They, none of them would be mm. asking you the time of day and you're going to be saying, no, you can't come into someone who's been in a cell with him for 30 years and yes, to someone who's never met him before. So unless you know who's who, I would leave all of them choices down to me. Yeah. Me and my boy, you know, yeah, so, yeah, so. Yeah. you go, well, the one thing we have got, Mr. Courtney, that your little band of men haven't, he said, uh, not everybody is a Crytrim fan. He said, and there is the definite possibility that it could be an assassination attempt, right? They couldn't get him for the last 30 years. He's been yeah. locked up in a wardrobe. Right now, he's driving at 10 mile an hour for 15 miles. Yeah. He said, and there could be an assassination. He said, the one thing we've got that you haven't, he said, is firearms, Mr. Courtney. <laughs> and I couldn't help it. I just went, hold it. I said, you must have the wrong fellow. I said, the one thing you've got that we haven't got is firearms certificates. We've all got a gun, you know what I mean? And that, comment to the chief of police that he couldn't actually go shoot you because <laughs> we're sitting out there. I just saw him that day go, right. Yeah. And that that done it for me. As he left that building, he just went, get me everything on this Dave Courtney yeah. fella. Who or what does he think? And they went round to every club where I had Dorman and went, you know, you won't have a license for a television, mate. Get rid of Dave Courtney's thing. They went to the magazine where I was writing, sack him or Went to, the, went to the radio station. You know, they just destroyed the whole setup of the Dave Courtney Naughty Boy thing. So while they're doing all this writing about me, I jumped on that bandwagon and carried on with a celebrity thing. Yeah. Right? Please yeah. believe me, you do not earn anywhere near the same amount of money um, writing books as someone might imagine. Right? It might make you famous, but you don't earn no money at it. You know, like 60 pence a book and 40, 40% of that, they take off you in tax. I've never paid tax. My life was a criminal, you understand me? And I'm like, what is that? It's a lot safer though. It's a lot safer, yeah. But I'm the only carrot on a stick for it is now I'm in the film world. I'm, I'm now actually going over to America next year to, to play a part where I'll get $280,000 to pretend to rob a bank on film. Gee. I never earned that when I did it. I never earned 280 grand my way when I actually went to stick them up, you understand yeah. what I mean? To pretend where they'll be going, can't look a bit more ferocious, Dave. Look, you know. Mm -hmm. So that as a carrot on a stick for me to stay um, on the straight and narrow is working. Yeah, but they were really out to 
get you, or some people were out to get you after the funeral, because all these stories came out about you uh, snorting cocaine yeah, off the coffin yeah. and putting water well, 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 on Why did you actually fall out with the, not fall out with the media? The media is actually just, um, especially in England, you have to keep the high moral code. You can't glamorise crime, quite right, and you can't make it look like crime pays. Quite right. Yeah. Well, that means you can't actually talk about Dave Courtney because I do the glamorous kind of thing. So when they are told that you do not make him look glamorous, they can write more or less, they get poetic licence, didn't they? Yeah. And I was getting all the headlines of best dressed gangster in you and all this stuff. So they just, all of a sudden, these anonymous phone calls came in that I was snorting cocaine off of his coffin. Yeah. I was putting um, Walkman Sony headphones, Walkman yeah. headphones on him. I was trying to play Ouija ball to get him back. If you yeah. knew Dave Courtney, yeah. please believe me, I hit myself. This fascination with the craze and the, the hold the craze had over the, the criminal world, they were in business, let's say, for a relatively short period of time and then in prison for over 30 years, but still they have this hold. What is it about them? Uh, it's myth, I'm afraid, that the general public have always um, fallen in love with the past era's naughty men, right? So the word gangster is, is, in my own eyes, a historical word, like knights in shining armour, cowboys, pirates, gangsters. Mm. All f uh, romantic naughty boys of, of different eras and you can no longer be a gangster. You're not pitting your wits against like a Sherlock Holmes policeman no more. You're trying to beat technology. Mm. Right? They're taking pictures of you from the moon, mate. Right? So you can't be a gangster no more. No more stick them up and robbing a bank. Everyone pays you Bartley cards. There's nothing, you know, it's a yeah, different yeah. era. And um, people that are chasing that, that little gangster world are going to find very, very painfully that it is no longer out there. Yeah. They are quite prepared for people to follow that little I want to be a gangster, which is why they're building 27 new prisons in England. And I'm afraid the hold that the Cray twins had over the general public was purely uh, mythology. Please believe me, nothing or no one is as big as a myth. Mm -hmm. Nothing, not Dave Courtney, not Lenny McLean, and definitely not the Crays. Right? No one or nothing is as, is as big as the myth. And they, they was allowed to, the mythology around them was allowed to grow because they, no one could actually see them and they was locked away from everyone, so it gets like a little, little romantic yeah. thing. If the person had been allowed out of prison, if they'd have been clever, and they wanted to stop this little um, hero worship, if they'd allowed them out of prison before they died in there, and let the general public see the actual real men, right, then maybe there wouldn't be so much yeah. mythology around it. But that's all it is, you know. No one or nothing is as big as, as their myth, and the craves definitely won't. Tell me about getting away with murder. Um, because you okay, literally did. Yeah, I did. I don't actually consider myself a murderer, my friend. I, in my eyes, um, if you ask me to go and kill someone for money, that's not my cup of tea. I might have been guilty of going go and ask him. Right? That might be my crime. But uh, I was actually um, in another country, supposedly looking scary enough so that the man that was doing this deal didn't get robbed. I obviously didn't do my job properly and didn't look scary enough, and they shot him. I had never seen a dead body, mate. Mm. I definitely hadn't seen one dying. Right? And when I actually see him get shot and I turned around and the fellow's closing one eye, right, aiming a gun at me, my crime is this. I shouldn't have had a firearm on me, but I had no qualms whatsoever about pulling that out and going ping, and I'm not even a good shot. So I actually go, thank you, God, because I couldn't do that. Right, and then done a Linford Christie and ran out of the country. Right? Um, I don't consider myself a murderer in that. You understand? I mean, I know on paper it is. Yeah. And in England, you're judged by the final frame. You pulled the trigger, and right? but I would like anyone, however, so on the right side of the fence they were, that in the same situation I was, please stand someone up in front of me that would go, I would not have shot back on a rather not by the law and died. Because he definitely, if, if anyone ever pulls a gun on you, the two things that enter your head are one, is it real? And two, would he use it by looking at the eyes? Before they hit me, it was all true. Yes, it's real and he'd use it. And he's closing one eye to shoot me. Mm. I have a go like that. <laughs> Odd. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not, um, 
I'm not trying to justify it to you. It's already justified in my head that I've done the right thing. And I apologise for that, and that's how I've got to have it. And I'm afraid the building that it was in, they was making blue movies, and at the time they was making snuff movies, yeah, yeah. where the people are just, you know, not yeah. disappearing. And that happening in the place that it happened, and me running out the, uh, running out of the building, pretty quick, I might add, <laughs> pretty quick. Linford Christie would have had to really put, to catch me up, right? Um, but in, in, in a murder case, there has to be one of three things, or they cannot even press charges. A dead body, a murder weapon, or a witness to the event. Yeah. yeah. Wasn't there another occasion though when you were in a, a, a pub and uh, you basically cheesed off a hitman? Yeah. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, was this? It was either uh, you or him. It was. It was. A, was not an idle threat. It was. It was. It was. He's a lot naughtier man than me, right? There's a lot bigger, naughtier, nastier gangster gangsters in England than Dave Courtney. I might be the loudest and the cockiest and the most pleasing for the TV cameras, but I definitely ain't the naughtiest. And some people can just look at the attention you're getting from this celebrity stuff, and if, every time someone will walk up to me and go, hello, Dave, there you go, yeah. this other person would hate you. Yeah. And all people are like, no, 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 he'd hate you. And, and uh, someone that was this is a good few years ago, this is like nearly, nearly 20 years ago. Oh, yeah, sure. Right? But then it would, uh, getting someone killed would cost you an awful lot of money and there wasn't that many people around to do it. You know, it might cost you 20 G. But now everyone's in it, man. You know what I mean? Everyone standing at the end of your road with a chamois leather in a bucket trying to sell you roses has killed more people than you know. It's come from a continent where they're mutilating each other with civil wars. Yeah? And, and now you just pick him up, give him a chamois leather, put him at the end of your road, and you think he's a dickhead. Mm. Well, it's not actually how it is. You know, these are. These are so getting someone top now is a lot easier than it was then. And uh, he made it very public what his intention was to do to me. And I would have been a fool to think anything other than it was real. If that threat is made to you and you are lucky enough to be to know that someone is coming to kill you, normally you don't know until you actually feel it. Yeah. But if you're lucky enough to know that's going to happen, there's only three things to do. There's one, you can run away. I couldn't do that. No. Right? Dave Courtney. Two, you can sit there and, no, it's not just Dave Courtney. It's where can I run to? I've lost the... I've lost the privilege of being anonymous. Mm. Everyone goes, oh, hello, don't you know, if I'm slipping out into a little hotel in Scotland with a bird I shouldn't be with, the guy goes, oh, Debbie Courtney, I love you. I said to you, you know what I mean? Every time the police pull me up, I can't actually go Bill Smith. I go, hello, Mr. Courtney. <laughs> yeah, right, so. Um, so run away. Run away. Just hope it don't happen. Yeah. Right? Or do it first. And I know that's. Uh, not an acceptable, um, where the law is concerned, answer to that problem, but it definitely was acceptable to me. But you were acquitted, but yeah. being typical Dave Courtney, you came out to the steps of uh, the Yeah, court. but that was before they brought out double jeopardy. The law was then, you yeah. cannot be charged for the same thing twice. I'd got found guilty, I didn't know I was going to go and bend the goalposts here, and I mean, did you do it? And because I'm an idiot, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Cut your tongue out, I went, yeah, I've done it. Yeah? That's the other thing I was going to cut. If I had two tongues, there are two things I'd have cut yeah. out for, right? Yeah. And it just... Um, do you still think about it now? Do, do you sort of wake up? No. Just no... Oh, well, listen. I had no option. And, and, and I might have made that sound quite plain to you, but the truth is this. If I'm coming to kill you, mate, and you have got prior knowledge that Dave Courtney's coming to kill you. Please believe me, I'm not just going to go and forget it, so I'm definitely coming. You can only do this. Yeah. Run away. Just sit there and wait for it and hope I don't do it. Yeah. Right? Well, they are the three genuine choices you have in that situation. And I knew that it was real. Yeah. I had the police sitting outside my house waiting for it to happen at my house. I had my wife and children sleeping in someone else's house. I'm in my own house with a loaded gun going, what am I doing? I've got people ringing me up saying, please don't come to the club, Dave, until this thing's finished, in case it happens here, we'll get you. I thought, oh, yeah, do I sit there and wait? Mm. Do I hope he's not going to do it? Or, you know what I mean? I didn't have many options left, and I'm afraid, well, that might not be an acceptable um, option in the normal everyday. Um, well, to most people watching this, I'm sure they'll, they'll say it's not acceptable. I'm not saying it's acceptable. Please believe me, I would have rather it not happened more than you. Uh, more than getting away with it, I'd have rather not done it. Believe me, but I had no choice. Mm. It was coming for me whether I liked it or not, so... Are, know, you, are I, you surprised you're still alive? I am, yeah. 
Really? Well, not, not, but just because of all the things that were actually on paper would go, um, they're bad for you. I do like a drink. I have been guilty of taking narcotics. I do drive very, very fast. I play with men with firearms and I put myself in situations that actually putting yourself in the situation is a silly thing. Not doing what you have to do to get out of it. Being silly enough to be put in that situation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, you've been shot, you've had your nose bitten off, you've been stabbed. I did win one once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean, there's nothing all, really... They're all not very good for your health. <laughs> <laughs> that, listen, getting your nose bit, let me tell you. There has not been the words made in the dictionary to tell you what that feels like. There imagine. ain't the words made no. to tell you what that feels like. As I'm just looking now, you can see it. It was, it was all that side there. Yeah. That whole side there, he's lying on the top of me and he's a big, big old fella. And he's, he's holding my hands, I was holding his, and there was a big crowd of people standing around the outside. And I thought, well, no, I'm all right, I'm holding my own. And he just went, sorry, Dave. And I thought, sorry for what? I'm thinking. And he just went, <laughs> I was like, Wow, and if, and if you could imagine, you know, you get like a little electric shock off the fridge for about half a second, you go, <clears throat> oh, wow, well, it's like that, yeah. on my face for 20 seconds. And my mouth is filling up with blood, and it's like, and I couldn't talk, I couldn't close my I couldn't think properly, because a, a bite is another kind of pain. A, like a bite is, it, it don't just hurt where he's biting you, it's all over your body, it was like, <laughs> and while his teeth were either side of my bone on the nose, it was like that, it was painful. And I thought, well, I'm going to sit here now and choke to death because I was mouthing it up. I've got to pull it out, not realising what was happening. As I pulled it away like that, it was like, it was like newspaper tearing to my head. And as I pulled it out, as it got past the bone, his teeth met. <laughs> and all that lot just come off. <laughs> I thought, that's my uterus. You know what I mean? Like, but the pain of that actually happening gives you strength to do other things, yeah. you understand me? Like, if you're running away from a policeman, for instance, you could, you could do an 100 yard sprint, it'd take you 15 seconds. You try and do it with a blue light flashing behind you and an Alsatian hanging off your Levi's, you'll do it in eight and a half seconds. <laughs> or you can go back in the morning at some fences you've jumped over when you was running away from someone and go, <laughs> I couldn't go without a ladder. Right? Well, pain and fear is the same, you know, and, and um, that got me out of the one situation of him lying on top of me, eating me. Right? Yeah. Some people bring a knife to a fight, he brought mayonnaise. <laughs> <laughs> Just where he didn't swallow it, I suppose. <laughs> that is really, really... Worse than being shot. Is, yeah, it was worse than being shot. Oh, horrible. Now, being shot's not like it is on the telly. No. Someone shot me in the leg here. Where? Can you see the mark? In there. The mark? And I hopped after him all the way to Brett Whitson and it blew my ankle out in the road. Yeah. That hurt. I bet uh, it did. But nowhere near as much as getting bit. Yeah. You can shoot me 10 times if you want, but don't, don't send someone around to fight me before dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you're 50 next year. Um, I'm yeah, sure. Thanks for bringing it up. I'm Cheers. sure it's going to be um, a very low key celebration. <laughs> <laughs> you're so childish. <laughs> you're so childish. Yeah, it is, yeah. What are, what are you planning, or is it going to be a big surprise? Um, I'm doing a little tour, a little tour of the countries for my 50th. Wow. Um, being what the rest of the world would perceive as whether I deserve this crown or not. The rest of the world look at Dave Courtney as the typical English naughty man, the cheeky chappy. Um, I've got no racial issues, you know, my lady of 20 years is Jamaican and all that, which is going down well for me in America. Yeah, Jenny. Over, Jenny, yeah, over, over here they can't glamorise crime. In America, if I could bottle a fart, they would buy it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, they're just so like, wow, on the, you ain't even come from costume, man. Yeah, Look yeah. at you, man. You know, it's like, naughty boys, all the naughty boys of whatever country I now go to, whether I want to or not, the local naughty contingent make a fuss. You understand what I mean? Yeah. You know, the Gambinos and the Triad Yard, you know, wherever I go, they seem to think they have an allegiance with me. And everyone I look at, I think, you're naughty. I don't know how naughty do you think I am, but I ain't that. <laughs> you know what I mean? I ain't that, but I'm glad you're a mate. And, uh, so I'm going to have a little, I'm going to go around and be spoiled by a lot of different people. Yeah. You're obviously having a, a good time at the moment. You've got a, a good lady, Jenny, yeah. um, some fabulous kids. I was going to ask you about your daughters. Um, when they bring home boyfriends, well, I don't know if they're married. I only yet. ever bring them home once. I was going to say, yeah. And what, the patio what, just gets bigger. What sort of dad are you? Oh, honestly, I'm a good dad. I, I don't have to tell my kids off as much as other dads would because my kids ain't trying to be a Dave Courtney. 
All right, don't forget they've seen the other yeah. half. Yeah. I can understand a child wanting to be Dave Courtney who lived across the road, the Rolls Royce Castle, you know, the fancy client. But my kids have lived, and yeah, they've been outside the courtroom waiting for me to get 20 years. They've yeah. been at the end of my bed when I've been shot. They've watched me being dragged out of bed by a policeman and all this, and they've been held hostage in Spain by gangsters and machine guns. So the last thing they want to be is whatever my old man does, I don't want to do that. Yeah, I'll be a dustman, so I don't have to guide them as much as, like, like I say, when I say go to prison, you learn how not to do it. Mm -hmm. They live with me, they just, I'll do anything, I just don't want to do that. So I've got an head start there, but um, one daughter is married to the very first boyfriend she's met, and it, this, this is the, this is not the wild child, this is a teacher, and yeah. she's married a teacher, and it's, it was all perfect for her, it's all puff lump, right? <laughs> um, I have a wild child, um, Chelsea, a daughter who, I don't know what I'm going to do when they do the boyfriend thing because it must be very hard. Well, I'm doing it all all right at the moment. Yeah. But it must be very hard for, for a man that when his daughter brings home her future husband, you know as a man what he is and what he ain't. Yeah. You know that she's completely blind to it and like this. <laughs> you can't cause the confrontation of, because right, if it's him or me, Dad, we're living together. Mm. And you either have to... Let him know that you know what he is and clear off out of town quick, son, or pretend you don't know. Uh, and just let him lie and just, like, it's that is, I'm going to find it very hard. You know, that's why all of my children decided to be lesbians. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to find it very hard, especially if I know what I know. And my gift that has carried me through the naughty world is this. No, I'm not, not naughty. I'm not a naughty man. I am most probably the best judge of character I've ever met. Yeah. And I do it quick, because if I'm wrong about you, mate, I, the penalty for being wrong is so high, yeah. I, I end up in prison or dead. So I'm good at judging you. Yeah. And if I've got the feather, but Dad, I love him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and this is dodgy looking at that cameraman over there. Hey. <laughs> Dave, I'm getting the wind up signal. It's been great talking to you. And you, boss. And uh, have a great birthday next year. I will, I will. Yeah. And also, if you could do me a favour, I've got a bit of a, a noisy neighbour. <laughs> you couldn't have a, a quiet worker. Don't. <laughs> Dave Courtney, thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Good night.